The Creatives with AI podcast. The spiritual home of creatives curious about AI and its role in their future. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to The Creatives with AI podcast. I'm your host, David. And on today's show, we've got David Barra. And I ran into David, I think, on LinkedIn. Is that right, Dave? It was a mutual connection connected us. Right. I couldn't remember couldn't remember which one it was. And the reason that I wanted to to talk to you is as as we were chatting about a few minutes ago, I think you sit at a really interesting intersection between education but also special education as well. And I think that the the conversation around AI just for education is one thing, but I think Personally, I think it has a lot of opportunity to help people with special educational needs and those sorts of things. And I really wanted to just have a chat with you to kind of pick your brain on that, if you don't mind. Do you want to give a little bit of background just so people kind of understand what, what, where you're coming from? Yeah, so currently, um, one of my jobs is I'm a senior lecturer of special needs. I teach at the University of East London, and I teach on an international master's program, and I've supported over 220 people on their international MAs. Um, I'm also a parent of two kids who have got additional issues. One of my children is a, is a cat, a brain tumor survivor. She had a brain tumor when she was two and a half. Prior to me being a university lecturer, I was a special needs teacher. Then I'd be in the primary school teacher. And also my own personal journey is I struggled at school. And if it wasn't for technology and my, and and word processing packages really coming to the forefront in 1997, I would be functionally illiterate in terms of writing because the first essay that I wrote for university was 1,000 words, 600 spelling mistakes at least with one full stop somewhere, not quite sure where it was. So, wow. And also in the early 2000s, I was, I'd qualified to become a primary school teacher and I was in charge of the IT and, and part of that ins installation of interactive whiteboards, um, laptops and other bits and pieces. So I've seen that whole process and I've utilised it and I can see how it enables, but it also can disable for, cert for certain communities as well. So that's roughly what I do. Brilliant. And what's the bad news? I'm going to end on the good news. I want to talk about the positive stuff later. So what's the stuff that worries you? with AI or, or where do you see that kind of bringing AI into education or in a broader sense technology, I guess, but, but looking at the AI that's coming along now, what sort of issues, potential issues do you see with that? People aren't going to use it effectively. And that's why I refer back to when I was in charge of IT back in the 2000s, where if people are listening from the UK, that they might remember the Tony Blair, uh, Tony Blair's budget and they, there were, I, it was hundreds of millions, if not billions, pumped into education and the IT sector. The problem, and it was a big problem, where everybody had the sector and the IT sector expanded massively. There was a hell of a lot of money in terms of investment. And there were hardware and software companies that were really getting government contracts. And it was phenomenal. It was a boom time for the companies. But unfortunately, the education sector... Uh, some of them saw it as a real threat. So through the cultural perspectives and people's attitudes, people were actively undermining the systems so the money was wasted. For example, in the school that I was in, I think my budget was anywhere between 250, 300, 400,000. I can't, I've, I've lost track of how much it was, but it was a phenomenal budget. And I can safely say the majority of it was wasted because because the culture and the attitudes weren't there from the staff who, who while my head teacher was an early adopter, the rest of the staff weren't. And that caused tension and that caused a lot of financial wastage. And ultimately, you had tensions within the staff. That's the bottom line. And so... It's a real when you point. say wasted, what do you can you give me an example of of something that would that would be where it would be wasted? Yeah, literally, equipment not being placed appropriately, data not being used, and equipment basically being stolen because of where it was placed. Um, equipment not being treated properly, so it was broken by staff. 
the kids respected it, the kids saw the potential, but the teachers didn't understand how the technology was enabling the kids, how the data from the technology could be used for good. And it was data for good in order to support the children in terms of their performance, supporting them psychologically, emotionally, and and and, and the, the soft element of what the technology can do. But the teachers didn't see that. So there was a lot of staff meetings and it was a lot of wasted time. It was as simple as that. So there was financial wastage and economic loss because it, the systems weren't integrated effectively or they hadn't recruited the appropriate staff with the mentality to adopt this. Now, people think nothing about interactive whiteboards, computers and other bits and pieces. But 22 years ago, massive amounts of attention. And again, I did one thing I did was I did a project for the BBC. It was called, I think, BBC... 24 or something other it was kids and we used to go over to white city with the kids phenomenal project and the bbc were were, 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 were supporting kids in terms of developing stuff and, and software but again the school some, certainly the school that i was in it was resist resistant and it wasn't pushing and enabling the kids and it basically was holding the kids back and these kids now oh God, they were they, they, they were 11 so that's 20 odd years ago so they'd be in their 30s now and to them, it's absolutely nothing. So it was attention, and it was the cultural attitude. That was the that was the big, real big problem. And do do you think was it the staff were afraid of it because they didn't understand it and didn't know how to use it effectively, or did they think that it was some sort of threat to education in general? Both. In all honesty, it was it was they didn't understand it, and they were there was sorry to come out with it, but they were stuck in their ways. They, they had a perspective on what education was. They were trained in a certain way. They had a certain attitude. And the ironic thing was they were using mobile phones. They were using computers for searching holidays. They were doing all the technology. They, they were utilising it in their everyday life. Yeah. But they didn't yeah. actually see the, see how it can support them in their work because it was the, we're used to the old ways. The old ways were effective. And they didn't see how it fitted within the education, even though. Were they effective? What? What the teachers? <laughs> the old ways. The old no, ways. the old ways. The... I think, and and I'll give you a second to think about that because I think, I think we have this. I think we have this sort of rose-colored spectacles view of the past and what the past was like, and I think, I think a lot of us you know, we, we tend to remember the good things and forget the bad things. And if I think back to what school was like and what's, you know, the, the tools and everything that my son has while he's in school now versus what I had when I was in school, I would hundred percent, if I was then, I would hundred percent take what they have now. It would have been amazing. I would have had so much more access to information. I had, you know, so many better tools, all sorts of stuff. And I don't know if, I think that there's some sort of nostalgia maybe that we all have about when we were kids and things were so much better, but it actually wasn't really that much better um, at the time. I don't, I don't know if you agree with that, but it's, sometimes it feels that way. It's like we, we live in such a, such a good world. Like a lot of people complain about the world the way it is today, but actually compared to 200 years ago, even, which is nothing in the, the grand scope of time, the world is so much better a place. You know, so many fewer people die, so many fewer people get injured. So, you know, people are across the board are so much better educated than they ever were. And it just, I don't know, sometimes it, it obviously it strikes a nerve with me a little bit when, when people say that. I'm, and I know this isn't you, I know this is them, but I'm just wondering if, if yeah, if, if you agree or you think that what did it used to actually be better? The thing, certainly from a technology perspective, is what's the purpose behind it? Yeah. In other words, the the software that was used, and there was a particular software that, that we tested, um, and it served a purpose to support literacy, very, very specifically. Now, at the time when I was there, I didn't have kids. Um, ten years, ten, five, ten years later or so, I'd got married, my wife had a couple of kids, 
both my kids struggled with literacy and I came back to that program that was you that was developed initially for the um Spanish population in America and then it was then it was adapted for the US for the English speaking population and then it was brought over to the UK now both of my okay. kids utilize this software to enable them to develop their literacy so it was a very specific tool and if people view the tech as a tool and what purpose does the actual tech serve within the education because it's tech for tech's purposes like i said to you earlier if it wasn't for word processing packages back in 1997 i i've supported over 220 250 odd people on their international masters i can i can read through my i can read through this stuff very very easily i've got masters had it not been for the technology the technology enabled me so it's understanding the purpose of the tool and understanding the limitations of what the tool can do but without people's attitudes the tool won't be effective it's like you know what's the use of a fork you can use a fork in loads of different ways what's the purpose of a knife so if you understand what the tool is and the limitations of the tool and if you can explain what you can do with the tool then it's a very very powerful thing and when you're coming back to the past it's what was the purpose of education then what was the purpose of education now because the kids now and my kids are 14 and 16 what purpose does education serve them to enable them to move forwards in society so it's and 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 i've got a big question with what the politicians are actually doing with the, with the state of education because education seems to have been a real big football for many many years and it's bounced around and other bits and pieces so what purpose does education serve and i'm going to move it on to north korea it sounds really really i'm going to throw okay. a curveball in north korea for example in a dictatorship education serves a purpose to serve the state in england i'm not it doesn't seem to be that there's that there's it seems to be a lack of clarity in certain countries in england in the states what's the purpose of education because without that lack of clarity how can you fit in all the rest of the systems does that make sense or am i going off on off, off on a tangent no 100% and i i would guess that the purpose of education broadly in the west is to create workers that that's the only they're not for me at least the way i see it and and has done for decades in the west is it's purely education is about giving people enough knowledge that they can go in and fill a role in a workplace and create value for someone else i mean that's that's pretty much it so the the whole thing is to create workers so it's not to go on. To, to interrupt yeah so in the 1950s and 60s and prior to that to create workers when you're saying was it coming back to your point about in the past yeah well i used to live in the london borough of redbridge and dagenham and fords of dagenham was probably about 20 minutes away from where i lived that was it so the purpose yeah. of the education system around that area was to go along get people and people would come along and they would then go into the fords of dagenham and they would work in the in the line and they would get very good jobs very good pensions and very good other bits and pieces yes so the education system had a very clear purpose there because there were very clear structured jobs that were around the question is what are the jobs are around so therefore what is the purpose of education so do we want the education system to enable people to be flexible in their mindset in an ever changing work work environment so it's not the rosy days of but many many years ago there were there was structure now it's a, you need flexibility in order i mean i've had 20 30 jobs in my lifetime at the, at the least i've I've lost track to be honest about it but yeah. you need and that's where technology again comes into enabling yes because technology can enable people to build up the skill set to then have transferable skills even driving is more technology you know you, you, there's there's far more sensory input when you're driving than there was 20 30 years ago and so you, it's a lot more information processing i think that's going on off a tangent but it's, again it's what's the purpose of education 
and how can technology support that? Do you think that education is serving its purpose at the minute the way it is? I would say no. Oh, no, yeah, it, no, yes, it does for a for, for, for yes, but, um, but then... <laughs> yes and no. Yeah, yes and no, yeah, because if you look at the amount of kids that are, have got mental health issues, if you've got the, the amount of kids that aren't going to school who, who are struggling, then actually is education serving a purpose because or are we more aware of, of kids needs so from my position as a parent with a couple of kids who've got additional issues i can say that education isn't serving its purpose at all because it hasn't served because it hasn't served the it, it hasn't met the needs of my of my children and the community i'm part of and i'm talking about the special needs community it's caused a lot of trauma and i know particularly and i've got to speak up for girls it girls who hit puberty and, I, and this may sound a generalization but girls struggle might struggle slightly more in the education system than boys and i feel and i feel that that actually the education system needs to support girls more because the, because it, it's more it's it just because it again this is purely subjectively it seems more compl complex and my daughter's on the autistic spectrum and you have levels of complexity with 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 that as well so i think the education needs to really support girls a lot a lot more and is that do you mean in in mental health or because I, I think most people would say that Girls are generally more mature than boys at that age, particularly in, in the teenage years. It, this, this is the received wisdom, and I'm sure they've done some studies on it or uh -huh. something, but I'm, I'm, I'm not a professor. But, um, but I think everybody pretty much agrees that usually, you know, girls are, are more mature than boys and whatever. So is it the, is it the mental health? Is it the social pressure? The social pressure. Is it the social pressure? Yeah. And is that around actually the the actual learning aspect of it see, or to in school to, 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 right. to, to me it's, it's you know it's because and when you and bringing it back to technology because you've got the technology you've got people on facebook tiktok and all these other bits and pieces so it's when when i was growing up i'm 53 it was you go to school that you had various social clubs and other bits and pieces you were in with some you weren't in with others but actually the kids are getting information and my i used to get my news from ITV, the BBC. Now they're absorbing so much more information. There are so many more pressures that are around. And again, the kids are on WhatsApp. They can join WhatsApp groups. They can join all these other bits and pieces. So there's a lot. I I think kids. Well, kids are under a lot more pressure. So the technology again, it's an advantage or disadvantage. They've got Childline around, which is great for kids and supporting their mental health, but it's got its limitations. So it's it's a double edged sword. There is there is no answer if that yeah. makes sense, kind of stuff. Yeah, I was I was listening to Jonathan Haidt um, the other day and on a podcast. I can't remember if it was it might have been Joe Rogan or another one, but he was talking about. I think he was talking about where they had interviewed teenagers and they said, you know, what do you think about not allowing teens to have mobile phones? you know, until you're like 18 or something. And he said that the most common question was, well, does everybody not have one or would I be the only one? And they said, well, everybody. And then they said, well, if nobody could have one, then I would love it. It would be great. And and that's in a way sort of reinforcing what you're saying, right? Is with access in your hand constantly to social media, all the pressures that come from that, but then you've got WhatsApps and Snapchat and all the other stuff that kids use. I mean, I have a 16 year old son, you know, he's, he's year 12, I guess this year, he's going to do his A-levels next year. And he hates all that stuff and he's never used it, but he's like, it's just ridiculous. He's like, you know, going on there, it's, it's like the wild west. And he's like, people are just idiots. And he's like, I, it's so he's quite good. He's like, literally doesn't live on his mobile phone. Couldn't really care less. He's a gamer. 
So he, you know, plays online and plays with his mates and they get on and, you know, that's where their social interaction is. But, you know, even even he can see it and he's just like, yeah, this is this is terrible. And even he says that. He's like, it'd probably be best if we just didn't have phones. It's, 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 if we, if we, let's say, move back to COVID, my, my, again, my, 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 my son, it, it, again, is a, is a bit of a gamer, yeah? And he's got friends, the beauty is, and COVID was phenomenal for this. He was on, I think, Roblox or, or some of these other games, and he was actually, he was developing, and this is where technology was phenomenal. He was developing soft working skills on Roblox because he teamed up with people. I think he was a guy from Denmark, Singapore, Scarborough in England and somewhere in the States. And they were developing roadblock stuff. So they developed right. business. They developed project management skills. They learned about geography and time zones. And what they were doing is they were coming up with their own social media strategies. Now that was, COVID was however many years ago. He still mates with these people now. Yeah. And yeah. it's that's where, again, technology is good because it enabled it enabled the social development for people who weren't particularly forthcoming in terms of liking physical social interactions, but it was developing those soft skills and coming back to what the purpose of education is. The beauty of, let's say, for instance, the stuff that your son does, my son does, is they're developing skills that are useful for the workplace. They're actually for the yeah. If you look at what your son's doing, that strategy, that planning, that coordination, on all of those things, they are the skills that that are needed in a lot of jobs going forwards. That mental flexibility. Yeah. If you then yeah. look into what the education system is doing and what the kids are actually learning in school, are they learning all of those soft skills? And you're shaking your head. And this is where. So does edu is education serving its purpose? Yeah. No. No. I agree with you. I don't, I don't, I don't think it is either. And I don't, I, I, I don't know what the answer is. And I think a lot of other people don't either. You know, I think some places and, and we're talking about education. So Finland has to come up at some point, but, um, sorry, if you notice that I'm laughing and distracted in the background, I have all of my soundproofing that I've put up behind my computer is all falling off the wall because the tape's not sticking it. So literally as I'm sitting here, I've got blocks of styrofoam falling behind behind my screen. <laughs> it's it's making me laugh. So also if the sound gets a bit terrible uh, throughout the podcast, I apologize. But um, yeah, no, go, thinking about the COVID thing and then I'll, I'll come back. But I think there was a there was an age group so that was, what, four years ago now. Yep. So that was the 13, kind of 13-year-olds, 13 12, 13-year-olds yep. around that time. And I would say probably 11 to, to 14. There was a, that cohort of students, probably more the boys than the girls because boys tend to game more than girls do, although a lot of girls game. But I think it's a, generally a boy thing. Um, I mean, it didn't impact him at all. And his friend group at all. In fact, it like you exactly like you're saying, it made them, it gave them different skills, but they just continued doing what they did anyway. Yep. Like they never hung out with each other outside of school anyway. You know, they, they were forced together during the day, but then they, they wouldn't even go to each other's houses. They'd rather sit at home and they'd game together and they'd get eight or 10 of them would get on discord and then they'd play a game and they would chat on discord at the same time. And you know, they did it that way because then strangers couldn't come in and they didn't have to talk to like random weirdos off the internet. <laughs> and, you know, it was, in fact, I, I think that he, that, that little cohort of people probably weren't so badly affected by COVID and the lockdowns as the rest of the kids on either side of that. I think the much younger kids who didn't maybe do that as much probably were affected. And I think some of the older kids who, maybe didn't game as much because it, it was a little bit behind them. Um, you know, they might have been impacted a little bit because that was their social time going out. That's when they should have been going out to, you know, pubs with their friends and drinking in the park. And like, I know, whatever, but that's what we all did. And, you know, that was a lot of the social bonding that teenagers have is, you know, you do that and you run around and, you know, you learn a lot during that period and they didn't get a chance to do that. So, 
sounds like maybe your son and, and, you know, some of his friends were just in that same cohort as well and they might have got through it all right, but there's a whole huge group of kids that didn't and there's a whole huge group of adults that didn't either. Um, You see, again, the technology was coming back to the education. It it allowed my son um, struggled at secondary school. He then... um, moved to a small school and he sat his GCSEs a year early. Now, that the, the, the skills that he learnt, and, and, and again, coming, sorry, talking about the technology, it enabled him to mature. It enabled him to develop those skills which are applicable in the workplace and build up that level of skill basis. So the technology was an enabler. As much as it was dis- it could have been disabling, utilized in the in the appropriate way in in a guided format not in a dictatorial format of this is what you must do it's within a semi within the structure of a game yeah within the structure of a planning thing so you've got the freedom to run wherever you want to but you've still got these these rules and regulations that is a phenomenally powerful tool because it allows people to intellectually go wherever they want to within their capabilities and develop that skill set without without real judgment from adults, but they're still being scored, they're still being measured, they're still being assessed the whole time, and they're measuring their own success. So, that, so again, the technology, it's not as though there's a teacher that's going along and saying, your grades are terrible, you're doing this really, really badly. It's actually something else that's guiding them through, and if they're not happy with that particular gain so to speak they can move on and develop their skill set elsewhere so technology is phenomenal because otherwise all you're doing is you're working with te- with individuals who've got their own biases and they're making the judgments based upon scores that they're given the games the, the games and the technology can help structure it even though it may not appear to be structured yeah i totally agree and there's i think I mean, I, I love to play games. I, you know, I grew up with the first generation of, you know, I'm, I'm only a couple of years older than you. So I was basically, you know, grew up at the same time. And I was our first, our high school in Memphis was the first high school to have computers. And, you know, so I was a teenager when, when kind of really PCs came in yeah. and then, you know, instantly games were part of PCs, you know, in the beginning. And then you had a you know, games on Commodore 64 even and yep. the old Atari systems and Pong and all that. Like I was that generation that grew up with those games. And, you know, I look at games now and I'll pick on Fallout 4 because there's a really interesting there's a really interesting part of Fallout 4, which is you can build your own houses. And what's really interesting, and I could see that from a, like my son's perspective watching him do it because him going through it, trying to learn how to build a house that works versus one that doesn't work was really interesting. So he learned a lot about spatial relations yep. and, and how to how to build a room that works. And, you know, then you try to put furniture in it and you're like, oh, well, it doesn't work because it's not the right shape. Or he would build some crazy design and then he'd try and, you know, make it functional. And it's like, oh, well, that doesn't work. And just like you said, that was a neutral feedback loop. Right. It wasn't like some adult going, you're no good. You didn't do a good job. That's terrible. Go do it again. It was a system. And he went, oh, yeah, OK, that didn't work. i got to try it again. And so it was a a much softer, more passive feedback loop. But at the same time, he learned super, super quickly. I- and now he can look at stuff like, you know, I'm redoing my office and he can come in and look at it. And he's developed some skills to be able to look at, oh, where should the furniture go and how should we arrange the room? And which he probably never would have got any other way. And so it's developing that cognitive cognitive awareness. And again, so can schools keep up with the cognitive ability of, of the kids? I mean, we've literally moved house um, on thir- Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I, I, I forgot. I've lost track of time. Um but I met one guy and he was, we had the movers in, yeah, really, really nice bloke. And I asked them, what did they do? And these guys work really, really hard. Physically, they are moving boxes all day. And one bloke, like, how did you do this? And he said, I left school when I was 13, I was bored. And I really didn't like school. Now, this guy 
contributes to society massively. He is doing an absolutely vital job. He knows how to drive a truck, a blooming great truck. He works he he really works very, very hard, physically, yeah. cognitively speaking, and school wasn't suitable for him, yet he's actively contributing to society ma- massively. And I spoke to a couple of, couple of other builders as well. They're not educated, but boy, are they, have they got good spatial awareness Do they understand certain things. They've, they've got phenomenal minds within a context. But, but they have a different education. Absolutely. And I think that's... And I... I get the feeling that we're coming out the back of this. I think the pendulum, I think, you know, the pendulum was way over on one side where nobody was educated very much. Yep. And then the pendulum swung and it's like, well, no, we've got to educate everybody. So the pendulum swung all this way and it's like, you must go to university. If you don't go to university, you're not educated. And then you you have all these people who went to, to university and I'm going to say this and you, whatever, come at me if you want, bro. But, you know, there are a lot of people that go to university then look down on people who didn't go to university because they think they're uneducated somehow. But what those people are is they're educated in a different area. Most of the people that I know that went to university couldn't fix their car. They can't even change the tire if they have a flat. Now, I think that's practical knowledge and I think that's knowledge. And, you know, there's a lot of people who can't do plumbing. They can't do basic electrical. They couldn't build a wall in their house. If they wanted to tear out a wall and move a wall, they would have no idea how to do that. I know how to do that because I worked manual labor jobs and I worked construction when I was younger. But that is a special knowledge skill. And it it it's sort of, again, I get wound up. I'm I'm actually quite easily wound up today. But it kind of winds me up when people are like, oh, they're not educated. And it's like, no, they're just not educated in the stuff that you're educated in. Uh-huh. And I think it's all equal. I don't think there's like levels. Just because you went to university doesn't make you special. It just gives you a certain, it means you can write papers in a certain way using a certain style of language. This is where AI is threatening those jobs. If you look at the lawyers and a lot of these skills, I mean, I, I, I met, Many, many years ago, I used to work in a, I worked in a five-star super deluxe hotel and I met one guy who was phenomenally rich. Um, he's in functioning literal. I think the, one of the richest per- people in England who owns a chain of shops, and I can't remember which one it is, cannot write. And, and yeah. you've got a yeah. wood fire. I'm not sure if it's not Target. I can't quite remember what store. We've also got, we've, we've now in our house, we've got a wood fire. And I went to a timber merchant, a sawmill, um, yesterday, and I spoke to a bloke, and he left school when he was 13. The guy's in his 70s now, and he said, I want to sell my business for 20 million. Now, this guy owns f- sustainable forests up north, and he can read people, and he will charge prices. I used to work down markets, and people would, the, the classic one that I tell people is, that I got taught how to look at people's shoes, look at people's fingernails, and the prices would vary, would go up by up to 400% to see, because yeah. even people were wearing rubbish <laughs> yeah. shoes, they could be yeah. expensive. And you look at if people are, are wearing, uh, have, uh, what you call it, have got their uh, finger fingernails buffed, which means they've got money. You then look at people's watches. That in itself is a skill set, which isn't taught within schools, which isn't taught within universities. Yeah. Which is yeah. so? Can AI teach this? Can schools teach this? And it's these are the soft skills that enable people to really thrive in society. But so so let's let's move. I know I mentioned Finland earlier, and then I never went back to it. And just let me close that loop before before we move on to the next thing. But I think I have a lot of friends who are Finnish, and I I love Finland. I could live in Finland. Hundred percent. I would love it. It'd be including amazing. Including the mosquitoes, including the mosquitoes and all the cold in the winter. I don't mind. It's worth it, frankly. Um, but that's just me, anyway. Um, but one of the things that I find really interesting that they do in their schools is they teach the kids, or they're now starting to teach the kids a lot about trying to analyze things that they read online and understand is that something that they should believe or not believe. And they're teaching them those skills that the analytical skills to be able to say, okay, you've seen something online. Should you just believe it? Or should you maybe try and do a bit of research to see if you think that that's actually correct? And it's actually something that they teach them in school. 
And I'm like, that's so amazing. You know, they're they're not doing any of that in the UK, at least as far as I know anywhere. I've I've not heard of it and they certainly don't do it at my son's school. And it's that the critical thinking, but also the skills to understand where to go, how to, you know, go where to go to find information, how to check it, how to see if it's correct. And it's the like you're saying, it's those sorts of skills. That's not a direct knowledge skill. It's not like, you know, you have to memorize something or you know biology. But that's kind of one of those soft skills for digital and online. It's you have to be able to develop a sense of that doesn't sound right and then be able to do your own investigation. And I think that's one of the things that we could start to teach that would be an easy thing to teach and I think would be an easy thing to add to a curriculum that wouldn't cost too much extra effort. Um, Although I could see where that could could get somewhat dodgy based on political lines and stuff. If you had people with a, a personal political agenda, then you know, that, that could be a little bit risky, but other than that, that, that anyway, that's what I was thinking you, about the Finnish system is that you, they you teach need the staff to feel comfortable enough to be challenged. And that's, and so therefore it comes, it, 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 and I, I agree. I would be interested to know the types of staff that they recruit within Finland and the personality types that they recruit within Finland, because that because for, for that to be taught or enabled the staff can't should not feel threatened by the kids and that then if if you're looking at the assessment system as well that then you need to create an environment where in england where we've got ofsted where ofsted value that type of thought process where they see the kids my, when my son was was at school last year, the, the kids were actually arguing with the teachers, but they they weren't actually arguing with them. They were actually encouraged to argue, and for that process. Now it was a very small school, and the and the kids absolutely loved it. It was mentally challenging, but they had a very very small number of staff, and the staff were recruited and had that mentality. The question is. Mm-hmm you would need to well no 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 it was not the question it's a case of do does the the current cohort of educationalists that are in the system have that skill set to feel challenged by the children yeah and by the by the pupils because you need more of a growth mindset you need the, that level of flexibility and in coming back to when I said about North Korea and other bits and pieces, it's, you know, like, do you want people who are linear or completely flexible? Uh, yeah. And so it might mean that in Finland, the type of, type of stuff they're actually recruiting actually have a certain type of mindset and they're not threatened and they're comfortable with and Because also you need people, you need staff to feel comfortable within themselves as well. So yeah. it's, it, 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 it's, I can, Again, sorry to, I'm not, I agree with you. Do education systems have the ability and flexibility to incorporate that? Because that's absolutely vital. Have, are, are, the, are the right people in the right place in order to do that, particularly with the staffing crisis they, they have? And coming to AI, and this is where AI could be very, very useful because there's a shortfall in educa- in teacher numbers. So actually, that the AI can take up some of the slack from lesson preparation and all the other bits and pieces, and then enable the staff to actually do that work of flexibility of thinking, creative, challenging, and other and those sorts of environments as well. And know that it's done within a structured ba- a structure that you can argue. And then the moment that lesson stops. Then you walk away and it's like, actually, we're getting on with the world. But we were there to argue because that was the lesson. Does that sort of go, mm. that, that links into the Finland sort of stuff? Or yeah, I've just yeah. gone, off on, gone off on the tangent. No, 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 exactly. Um, I think that, yeah, the whole, I mean, f- the whole education system, just to, to talk about that from what I know in Finland is, you know, every teacher at every level is master's degree minimum. And 
but they also pay their teachers extremely well. And it's a respected role in society. So parents respect the teachers, the kids respect the teachers, the government respects, like they understand that, you know, that is a hugely important role. And I think in a lot of other countries, that's maybe not as, you know, in the U.S., from from when I was there, you know, if you said you were a teacher, do you know what I mean? It wasn't like, it's, it's not like you're a doctor or a lawyer, whereas in Finland, it's kind of at that same level. It's like, you know, doctor, lawyer, teacher. It's, it's a, it's a very well-respected thing. And I think, I think that, that propagates through everything. It's, it's how the parents tell the kids to respect the teachers and, you know, that just, it permeates through all of society, which makes the whole system better. Now I realize that Finland is a country that's like what geographic is geographically as big as the UK, but it's only got like 4 million people. So, you know, the population is much smaller to have to deal with and it's easier to deal with smaller populations. And I get that, but you know, it, anyway, it's, it's always an interesting, you know, sort of model that people talk about, but I agree with you. I think not only can AI help the teachers and give them more time, but I wonder at what point are we going to, AI is not there yet. It still hallucinates a lot and, you know, makes up stuff that isn't always correct. But I think as we move forward over the next five to 10 years, that's going to pretty much resolve itself. And it's going to be, it's going to be way more accurate than any human is ever going to be. And so if you go and ask it about something, you'll get a good answer, I suspect. But then that opens the question like, but then what do we need to teach people? Like, what's the value of like, I guess it's what we're talking about, but what does that free us up to then learn other stuff? Do we go back to learning art and do we go back to learning music and trying to be creative and doing those sorts of things and doing the stuff that humans are good at, which is interacting with each other instead of knowing multiplication tables? Like who cares? You don't even need to know, like, I don't need to know. I don't need to know any of the algebra that I ever learned in school, trigonometry, none of that. I don't need to know any of that. If I want to be an engineer, yes, absolutely. Then that's when you learn that stuff, if that's what you want your career to be. But there's machines to do all that stuff now. I don't need to know that. So is that what AI gives us the opportunity to do is to say, okay, we can relax on learning you know, all of this stuff, we only really need to know about 20% of all the, let's say, mathematics that we try and teach kids up to A-level. Like, we don't need to know all of that. We need to know basic arithmetic. And if we spent twice as much time on basic arithmetic and less time trying to teach statistics and algorithms and that sort of stuff to kids who, frankly, are never going to use it and don't care, could we better use that time? And do we think that AI is going to help with that and help us be able to reorganize? Don't have an answer. There's a lot in there. Yeah, Sorry. I tend to it, do it, that. Sorry. <laughs> the okay. So in not answering your question, the education system doesn't teach people how to learn and think. Coming back to the Finnish thing. So again, it's, I, I, again, I don't know how many jobs you've had, but I, I've had loads. And I'm, 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 Loads. Yeah. So my, my dad, who, God rest his soul, and he'd be in his I don't know, late 80s or whatever it is, he told me, always have a backup. Always have a backup plan. So I was an apprentice aircraft engineer when I was 17. Yeah. I've done many, many, many different jobs. And if something doesn't work out, I can become a lorry driver. That's it. It's absolutely fine. It's, you know, something that pays the bills. But my dad taught me that that mindset, which I've never, ever forgotten, which is actually learn how to learn. Yes, education doesn't teach people how to learn and that level of flexibility. One of my favourite jobs in the whole wide world was welding. And I'll look at a weld and I'll go, oh my good God, this is not a work of art. This is absolutely beautiful. Because, but that I learned about the fine motor skills and that level of coordination and that yeah. social skills and about my body on how to move it and other bits and pieces. So I learned. And, and and I've met. I mean, I've I was a security guard once, and I met some phenomenally educated um, security guards 
who were immigrants, particularly from Nigeria, and um, and they were and they were trained lawyers. Some of them were doctors. I met somebody, a colleague of mine. Her father was a vet from Albania, and his skills literally didn't transfer. The paperwork didn't transfer over, and the, and, and, and so people will do these manual labor jobs. They'll do jobs to survive, but they've learned that level of flexibility on what do I need to survive? How can I be flexible in what I need to do? And that, unfortunately, yeah. and I, and, and, um, the education system is failing people in learning how to learn. And so when you're saying about the AI can do the grunt work, but what happens if the AI fails? So there's a cool set of skills that people need to know how to do writing, arithmetic. My spelling, again, I'll, I'll readily admit, isn't great when I write stuff down, but I know how to spot a spelling mistake. I, it takes me two or three times as long as somebody else to write something down manually and it will go, yeah. but I can spot the spelling mistakes without a shadow of a doubt. You know, I, I can read people's work. That's not the problem, but my own stuff is very, very laborious, which is why technology is the advantage. So when you're talking about let the technology do the grunt work, absolutely brilliant. But I know how not to do stuff. And that's where the technology, the technology is an enabler. But if we don't, if kids aren't taught that that mentality, they're not taught that level of flexibility. And it comes back to your son, my son, and what they're going on in Finland. People need to learn how to be flexible in their thought process. Or at least learn how they should be flexible. And how much of that is on the parents? Okay. Right, so I would say, where are we going with this? Because part of it is I'm a parent of two kids who have got additional issues, yeah? And you've got ageing, you've got old parents who are older as well, yes? Parents who are, to be honest about it, people, people are struggling. People are struggling with themselves financially, socially, emotionally. And so how much... It- let, let, let me qualify what I meant. I don't mean the the teaching and the spending the time teaching, but I think I think parents foster an environment of curiosity and and learning by how they interact with their kids, I think. And so you can encourage your kids, you can teach this this doesn't create it doesn't take any extra effort from being a parent. If you're busy and you've you're a single parent or you're an older parent and you've got jobs and responsibilities and you're struggling with money and everything else, you can still help your children to be open to the idea of learning and to be curious and to stimulate that sort of that activity. And I think even more so now than you used to be able to because there are so many more resources now that are easily and readily available. You know, it used to be when I was a kid, if I was curious about something, you know, my grandparents had Encyclopedia Britannica. So I was all forever being told, go look it up, go look it up, go look it up. And they never said, you know, they never discouraged me from that. They were always like, go look it up and come back and tell me what you learned. And so it was, you know, it's those little things that you can do I think that's what I mean more about it's more how you talk to your kids about it and how you teach them to be in in themselves and their worldview, I guess is what I'm in. It's not up to teachers to do that. It's up to the parents to do that, in my view. Again, I, I come back. Some of some of the world that I live in, people are on antidepressants. People are on medication. So and 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 people are you've got again aging populations with health with underlying health issues as well so do people have the cognitive ability the actual capacity to do that or are people exa- too exhausted to even think um and so yes parents should do that for sure without a shadow of a doubt and it's something as it's you know you can you, I mean uh, the the classic science lesson for me if you're talking about curious is classic science lesson to me is cooking yeah you meet you, you, you come, you're, you're making pasta and it's like you want curiosity right we've sat down at a meal we've had some pasta it's a bit hard mum it's a bit hard dad what is it 
well, actually, the science behind it is this, and let's do a science experiment, yeah? And the, the was it like the, to the tomato sauce is just a bit too off? Okay, so let's add a bit of sugar. And it's that, that natural curiosity that you can actually embed within it. So the learning is all around, yeah? The learning is going for a walk with a dog, with a cat, the other bits of beast. You know, the, so like you brush the cat a little too hard. You 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 you, you see a bird flying away and because you, you're a little close. You can naturally do that within everything. You can, I mean, the beauty of blooming Netflix and, and, and Disney Plus and all these other little bits. You can, you can play the things back now. You can embed natural curiosity in it. And coming back to the Encyclopedia, pre, Encyclopedia Britannica, that was actually very disabling. And the reason why it was very disabling is because if you weren't literate, you didn't have access to that knowledge. But now through the technology, the beauty is you've got text to speech. You've got yep. all of these other yep. bits and pieces. So actually Encyclopedia Britannica, even if you were the most educated people came from the best family in the world, whatever, it had absolutely everything. You were literate could, or you couldn't read. You couldn't access that knowledge. The beauty of technology yep. nowadays is it actually equalizes things. I mean, I, I ran a workshop for people in Ghana, Ghana or Gambia for teachers in a village a couple of years ago. And how? They were on their mobile phones. I mean, literally this was it. And then I gave them a little, little workshop on it and they implemented it straight away the following day in their kids in their village. That's how technology is such a powerful tool. And the parents can enable it. It's just having the capacity yeah. and, and, and it's not... The kids coming back to the teachers. Sorry, I'm, I'm rambling, but it isn't. I remember when I was a when I was a kid, and this was in the 1980s. We were taught um, cooking. We were taught how to cook. I don't know if the kids are now taught how to cook, but my my son was. He had um, he had cooking classes when he was in like year seven or so eight. It's our the the, the parents of tomorrow being taught the skills that we were taught in a soft way in schools. Yeah. And so it's that generational thing. So how can we be good parents if we, some of the stuff we weren't taught within school from yeah. our parents? Does that? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean. No, it's a, it, it's a great question. And, but these are, you know, these are the questions that we have to try and answer, I think. And this is where I think, you know, potentially a tool like some sort of an AI tool brings some advantage to it. Like you said, you know, the other thing about Encyclopedia Britannica thinking about it is that it was also enormously expensive. Like they were not affordable. My Luckily, my grandparents had a, you know, they had a good lifestyle. My grandfather owned a real estate agency and, you know, made decent money and and whatever. But, you know, Certainly when I lived, my mom was a single parent and I stayed with my mom a lot. I lived with my grandparents a lot and I had my mom a lot. And, um, you know, when I lived with my mom, we didn't, we didn't have anything. So, you know, everything I, all the books I got and everything I got from the library. Um, but it, then again, you know, that was a totally different world. There were big libraries back then. There's no libraries now because no one goes to the library anymore. But it was, again, it was a totally different, you know, kind of thing. But I can't help but I guess my hope is that you know we can we can use AI and that that, that some of the AI stuff that's going to come out is going to be useful. Do you know what I mean in that sort of way to really open it up and and maybe the maybe the kids and whose parents don't know some things or they don't have access to some of the tools or you know they're just trying to make ends meet they can't go out and buy expensive laptops or whatever that maybe through the school system and through some of the tools and the mobile phones that they'll they'll be able to use some of these tools to actually, you know, answer some of those questions and to actually get the answers to stuff that they don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, the, yes, I completely agree. I mean, if, if you think about, like, well, I remember if, well, a, a Commodore 64 or, or, or I had, um, I forgot what, the, uh, the Sinclair Spectrum or something, rather, and it was about 200 quid. I mean, what's ridiculous is yeah. my mobile phone, I'm not, I don't pay any more, I, I refuse to pay any more than 150 quid for a mobile phone. Yes. And I can do right. far more on my mobile phone. And considering 150 quid now is, I don't know what that, what it would be worth 
you know, going back all those all those years. So the technol the, the cost of technology has come up. The the threat that I have, and this is a big threat, um, is the cost of electricity. And it's actually the cost of electricity because and also how much AI is going to use in terms of of, of the water behind it, you know, those the, the actual resources. But unfortunately, due to due, due to the way the world is, the electricity prices have gone up. And as opposed to a couple of years ago, when the electricity prices, I mean, my energy bill in our old house went from seven, or our um, utility bill went from about seven hundred to about two thousand one hundred very very quickly. That meant that we started looking for energy saving devices. So although the tech may have come down in price, the actual cost of accessing that tech because of the electricity bills is going up and people are yeah. on um, electricity meters and, and there are those issues around that. So there is a cost to accessing this tech tech and, and it's not an equalizer. So the AI is a phenomenal tool and the AI potentially is very, is free, but the electricity isn't the computers and the phones aren't that expensive, relatively speaking. I go for um, second-hand computers, to be honest, but I don't need particularly powerful ones. Yeah, that 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 does me for what I need for the moment. But it's the cost of electricity that comes, and so if you've got people right. who are financially yeah. distressed or disadvantaged, then are they going to be metered on utilizing the AI and all all that technology? I, I'm throwing that into the no. Mix. It's no, no, no. It's a great, it's a great question, and it's gonna, it's gonna be really interesting, and it's gonna force people to make decisions. I think it's almost the thing. It's it's almost this, the position we're getting with Sky, and I know this is gonna sound totally random, Sorry, but Sky being like Sky TV. Yeah. So you know, a lot of the content that you used to get on TV and you could get access to for free now has been put on a, you know, behind an app yep. that you have to subscribe to. So, you know, you either subscribe to it on the Sky's platform or you subscribe to it directly. And it's like, well, now what's the point of having Sky? Because if all the stuff I watch is on two or three apps, are the two or three apps individually less expensive than I would pay for Sky and then pay for the those channels on top of it? And, you know, I'm having to look at that and it's like, well, I have to make a choice. So I'm about to just bin Sky off completely because I get discounts, you know, on on things like Discovery and, you know, like the sports stuff I watch is all on TNT or what used to be BT Sport, which is all part of EE. So my mobile contract is tied up in that. So when I renew my mobile contract, I get discounts on all that. Like it, it's all shifting and moving. And it's like you said, you know, we're going to have to make decisions on what do we do? Do we still have a TV? Do we still, you know, or are we going to just use our mobile phones? And this, because and this is where the maths comes in. So coming back yeah, to the schools, yeah. this is where you need basic maths in order to. But that's like I said, though, that's arithmetic. Yeah. That's basic maths. It's not. It, you don't need algebra for that, right? So, again, I think we'd we'd be better off spending time making sure that everybody really understands the basic arithmetic and reading. And reading, you know, comprehension as much as you can to, to be able to understand what you're reading, to be able to read and to be able to do basic maths and, and basic calculations. And then if you have that base, that's the base level you need to then learn anything else you want to learn. See, if we go back to the oh, I'm old kind of stuff, I think it, they should actually have lessons, dedicated lessons on board games like chess, drafts, backgammon, um, World of Warcraft, and all these all these board games, yeah, yeah, which is actually teaching those cognitive skills and those social skills as well. They actually, to be fair, I, you know, I don't mean it's a games lesson. You know, literally learning yeah. different games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be a phenomenal. That would be a very, very powerful tool. Could that because that would allow people to develop that flexibility, that those social skills everything else those numerical values i mean one of the best games ever is monopoly uh, yeah and, it, it, and bridge sorry. if you want to get more complicated and bridge if you want to get more complicated never, never played it <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's a nightmare the, the, it, it, it's those skills rummy cube is great i mean and, 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 and yeah. it's that level of flexibility that, that then have those transferable skills which then 
because AI isn't when you're using a AI, I think, and what I've used of it, you still need to know what to put into the AI in order to get the feedback. So if you don't have that a bit that level of flexibility and yeah, that cognitive right. flexibility to think around it, it's rubbish in, rubbish out. And if you and if you still put in the same rubbish, you're still putting in the same stuff time and time again, you're not going to get the positive feedback. So you need people to teach that level of flexibility, be it and you said about the parents. So what yeah. you need to do is the parents need to teach the kids the level of flexibility. And that curiosity, that's what really mm. needs to be embedded within the education system to then yeah. enable people to maximize the technology, to think it's not it's not just a tool, it's how can I utilize a tool to serve my purpose and for good? Yeah. David, I just realized we're at an hour. <laughs> Sorry. <I'm> just... <laughs> no, 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 it's brilliant. And do you know what I particularly liked about our discussion and, and the points that you raise is you actually, in a lot of the conversation, you talked about how, you know, part of the solution is the fact that the teachers have to be willing and able to, to teach the stuff that, that they need to teach, or, you know, it's all well and good for, for people to say, we need to change, you know, we need to change what we teach our kids. But we need people that can teach that and that are willing to teach that and are able to teach that. And that's something I think that a lot of times gets overlooked. And I think it's fantastic that you mentioned that in the conversation a few times. That came up a few times today, and I really, really like that. And it's I know I didn't drill down on it too much, but it has absolutely given me something to think about. And it's a, it's it's something I'm going to think about for quite a while, I think, is, you know, we need to remember the teachers and we need to remember, you know, that there is somebody who has to deliver all this stuff. And it's all well and good for us to to talk about it. But if we can't implement it, then it doesn't make any difference. And, you know, so there's a there's a whole other side of that. And that's a whole nother podcast. I look, that's a, that's a topic entirely on its own. And, and I know I've talked about this a few times and I do want to set up an education with AI podcast specifically to only talk about education, because I think there are a lot of conversations to be had, you know, from, from the, the perspective of the schools, the teachers, the parents, the students, government, you know, the, the, there's, there's sort of five, because of the, you know, because or, or more viewpoints to, to kind of bring together and to, to understand how it all fits. The, the hats that I wear, I'm more than happy to chat to you about that because <laughs> my wife and I yeah. wrote the inclusive education policy for Nigeria, the support that I have for, yeah. the, for, for, for happy to chat because I wear di different hats. Brilliant. Well, I think that'll do us for today. Is there anything you want to end on? No, Any words very, very of much. wisdom? It's no? just, thanks okay. very much for the conversation. Brilliant. All right. Well, thanks very much. And we will hopefully we'll speak to you again soon. Creatives with Cheers. AI is a proud member Cheers. of the Bye. AI Podcast Network. To stay up to date with current episodes and show information, subscribe to their newsletter at podcastnetwork.ai. And don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast platform so you'll always get the episodes as soon as they're available. Thanks again for listening and stay curious. curious. curious.